So how did this, uh, so what was the next sort of big thing for you then, the feminist movement, or did the Descent of Woman come first? I mean, was all that, was that the same thing? Um, it, it you was involved in the politics of it before the book? I was, I was right on the, I was writing The Descent of Woman. I just started thinking about it when uh, the female eunuch came out, Germaine Greer. So there had been, I found when I started writing it and researching it, there had been, um, by the time my book came out, there had probably been four or five books with a feminist message and cries of protest and so on, and in America, Gloria Stein and that lot. But um, I was in, at the beginning of it, in the sense that um, it was a great revelation for anybody to think that actually Darwin was not necessarily our enemy and evolution was not necessarily something we said we don't believe in that because um, up until then all the accounts of human evolution had been saying in effect biology is destiny if you're a woman you can't expect to be very bright can you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, so the evolution came in at the same time and they were the same thing they were the same thing and, and can you remember what sparked your Yes, idea. it was an, it was Robert Ardrey and Edmund Morris, because um, they came. They were suddenly the spate of books about um, the great mighty hunter on the savannah and how this it explains everything about life because um, we are descended from this mighty hunter who had who catched the meat and his mate hardly ever made him an appearance, but she had to sort of flash her eyelashes at him <laughs> so that um, he would be kindly, kind enough to give her a lump of meat. Well, in fact, I mean, in his hunting garden communities, the, the, the meat turns up about once in three weeks. In the meantime, she's feeding everybody mm. with the gathering. And um, also that, I mean, stuff like all the biology, their breasts and so on, put on to attract me. This is rubbish. I mean, they have a baby, not for a month. And, and so when, when, uh, when was the Naked Eight? When did Desmond Marsh write that book? Was that I don't know. I could give it to you. Uh, but it was, it, it was before the Descent of Woman. Oh, yes. It was before the Descent of Woman. So was that, well, did you read that and did that sort of make your blood boil or something? Yes. And, and Robert Ardrey was doing the same thing. I mean, I'm sure he's a very nice guy. Like me, he was a dramatist who got fascinated by it. But he was fascinated with the violence of it. Mm. And they'd all been taken up by, well, you saw Raymond Dart saying, you can go to your eyes up and get the stomachs up and so on. And they thought this was the essence of humanity, this um, slaughtering. And I thought, well, you know, I, I go around Mount Ash and I see men wandering around. They don't look as if they leave all too rough to be guts out and uh, I mean, uh, uh, there must be some other thing in our inheritance. So um, then I thought, I've got to protest against it. Nobody was protesting against it. I thought, you know, it doesn't even make sense. And, I mean, they would say, well, of course, we became naked because the mighty hunter got overheated. And she wasn't overheated. She was left there stuck. And, um, uh, I mean, she, she was half of the species, for God's mm -hmm. sake. So I, I got... She's more naked than he is. She's more <laughs> naked than he is, yeah. Uh, so I thought they got it wrong. Um, I, I'm not, not sure that I've got it right, but they've got it wrong. And um, then I found in the Naked Eight, reading it more carefully, this sort of page about Alistair Hardy. Mm -hmm. And I thought, he's got it right. And uh, so I wrote the book. And, uh, and you, you, you did contact him, didn't you? You, you wrote to him? Yes, I wrote to him. And I said, I'd like to do this. And he. The first letter, well, I, I'm not sure, you know, I'm thinking to write a book about it myself one day, um, because the, he'd only ever written these two articles. But then I had another letter, he talked to his publisher, and who had said, um, it would probably be a very good idea if a popular version came out first, that would rouse interest in it. And then, but, I mean, he never, he never did write it, and um, I sort of, found out various ways what new material he had that hadn't been in the 
in the article, so there was not really very much. Did you ever meet him? Oh yes, met him twice. Where, where did he live? He lived in Oxford, he was, so uh, did uh, he was an Oxford professor. Oh, so did you, did you, you, nev you never saw him when you were at Oxford? Then? Oh no, because I was on the literature side, he was there. But did you know about him? Too? No, did, you, know, you didn't have any friends that uh, were... No, never heard a whisper about him. Um, some of his, uh, some of the people I met since were his pupils, and they had known about this idea before he ever published it. I suppose if he had um, a group of interested students, he would drop a hint mm. that this was po a possible thing, um, where where he wouldn't have had quite the nerve to publish it. But, um, no, I never knew anything. It's that people, you know, he, he could keep it under his hat for so long and be so afraid to publish. I mean, well, I mean, it, it, he, he was scientist. right, he was right. I mean, the, the sky fell on him when he published it. Um, um, Wilfred Le Girl Clark rang him up and said, Alistair, never do that again. <laughs> I mean, he was a guy, by that time, he, he was a fellow of the Royal Society and a professor, and he got knighted and everything. I mean, you wouldn't think that you'd need to be afraid by that time. Well, he wasn't. I mean, he'd waited until that point when he couldn't really be voted out or anything to publish it at all. But even then, I mean, there was a terrible fuss, and they thought he really made a fool of himself and let the side down. And I just don't understand that. I mean, nobody, so nobody, nobody, nobody up there said, well, he might be right. They just said, poor Alison, he's lost the It's incredible, isn't it? Because, you know, they're, they're, they're supposed to be scientists, they're supposed to be objective. And it's almost like mm -hmm. a club, sort of a... But it looked so unlikely. I can see it from their point of view. It looked so unlikely. They had it all planned out. I mean, they mm -hmm. felt, well, we, we understand all these things. Mm -hmm. They didn't, but they had they sort of they did. Sw swept it under the carpet, the bits that were a bit fuzzy, and thought, well, you know, we're not quite clear about that yet, but we're getting there, mm -hmm. and it'll come, and it'll become clearer. And, um, and it sounded so unlikely. I mean, people would say to you, this woman who says we descended from fish. And, so <laughs> <laughs> and in New York, I had this great sort of, um, tour of New York and uh, in the New York Times it said um, this British woman thinks we're descended from sea otters. <laughs> so now you have to pardon my ignorance here as well. Um, there was another uh, chap, wasn't there, a German guy that also published something. Now Westenhofer had published this idea and, and Alistair died without knowing that he hadn't been the pioneer. He never heard of him. It percolated through. I mean, when the ideas, the news of this, I mean, because the descent went into about nine different languages, mm. French and German, so, so some people over there got impressed with this and sent me and said, Have you ever heard of her Um He was. Um, a professor at Berlin University, and I had thought he was a professor of anthropology, but he wasn't. He was a professor of something else, I've forgotten what. Something in science, something in biology, cybernology, anthropology. And he had written a, a chapter in one of his books outlining reasons why there might have been an aquatic period. And I got hold of this and I managed to get this chapter translated into English. And it mentioned several things that I had mentioned and Alistair hadn't. And um, so I thought this strengthens it. But the more I learn about Western Hofer, the more I find he had some very weird ideas altogether about evolution. Mm -hmm. But of course, to get to take on board something as startling as the aquatic theory, you have to have a mind that's fairly wide open. Mm. 